Well, welcome to the Tony Wilson Fishing Show, people. I am here, waiting for this one I turn around down at Tobba Fisheries, but not at their main complex. I've been carp fishing all night last night, a couple of three hours sleep, and what else should I do but go fishing? So I've come down to another lake here. There's two lakes, they're like canal sections, and they're really pretty. They're apparently they're the oldest ones on the complex, or the older lakes here. And they're full matches, they've got um, pegs here. Indeed, they've got a match up the other side on the second section there. I talked to some guys, I said, how's it fishing? They said, oh, it's really slow. <clears throat> I thought, oh, great, that's all I need. I come round here, it's a really pretty place. It's a bit like a wide canal, but it's got nice lilies and stuff over here. Look, you see the lilies? And it's absolutely tailor-made for beginners or novices or people, I'm going to say, of my age, or indeed anybody, wives I guess that want a bit of peace and quiet this water could be a, a, an absolute little gem not big it's shallow I just plumbed about three feet pretty well all the way across of course I've never been here before I have no idea of this deeper areas you can drive your car there you can walk down hard standing banks all the way around and it's sheltered look at all the uh, hedge up there the ground's raised the hedge is up and here behind me I haven't even got to put the brolly up it's absolutely ideal for yes float fishing so first job i do when i go to waters i don't know is to get some dog biscuits and bread and you can use floaters here and i spray them around i'm not going to lie i've already done it i don't know how the guys aren't catching it <laughs> in, in, in that other lake how can you not catch fish this is absolutely tailor-made for um float fishing quiver tipping, learning techniques and stuff like that. Perfect, perfect water. Apparently it's a good mix fishing. Yes, there's carp in there, plenty of carp. So, what I've got are these. I've got mixed dog biscuits. I tend to go through these and keep back these bigger ones for what I call proper carp fishing. But I throw these in, because Mike gave me these, as Jack Russell doesn't like them. The fish do, I can assure you. It is heaving. I've got some bread as well. They're not averse to a bit of floating crust. I've got some out the freezer. So take some, but I do this standard wise. If they allow floater fishing, I always do this and throw some out. Because although people might not be catching on the surface, the activity does actually make a lot of the fish come up because I think they hear the other fish coming to the surface. There's uh, probably going to be no problem on hopes catching fish. Now, another thing, I'll put some ground bait balls in there. I feel that's going to be a waste of time. Now you see that coloured water down there, I mean I've got polarising glasses on, you might not be able to see it. It's coloured all the way in here and I put some sweet corn and ground bait mix down there for some bream, trying for a bream. I feel that the carp are going to get it before the bream, but let's try and see what we can catch. Rigs, I'm on a waggler float and I've got a quiver tip. There's the old tried and tested, well known waggler float. And basically the carp are fighting over the bread and dog biscuits. All right, let's get the rod bent. You can virtually fish under your rod tops. I'm sure down here you catch fish as well. Look, there's one taking the bread off the surface. My float's dithering up and down. I'm gonna to have to put an extra shot. I did bait up farther out as well. Let's try over there. Personally, I think they just eat all the ground bait straight away. I'm baiting over there and there's mud coming out here so I'm going to bait right here under my rod top. All I've got is Bailey's uh, number one feed and sweet corn in there. I wanted to sort of break it up about there. There's no question I can catch them off the top if I, if I go out there. Oh my word, <laughs> I think he's going to eat the float. When I'm baiting my sweet corn on a single grain, 
I'll probably drop hook sizes in a minute. This is more of a sort of bread size. I don't think they're going to be having two grains as much as one. We'll find out. My God, he's nearly eaten the float. Oh, I missed that one. The thing is, it's so shallow that when they're swirling around, they actually stir the mud up and mix the ground bait up with the mud and the silt and makes them dig around a bit more. I might put another shot on that float for you. All right, I've got an extra shot on there. It's just a ridiculous amount of fish in here. It's going to look stupid if I can't get a bite. I might want less of a shot now. I'm assuming that a lot of the matchmen use sweet corn. And uh, <clears throat> that could be good for the bream as well. Right, let's try, try a good old banker of bread. First, I'm going to give him a few biscuits. There's some bubbles coming up. Right there. <clears throat> if sweet corn doesn't do it generally, Slow sinking bread flake does. Floats just off the end of my rod there. Now if I don't get a take on this, I'll be using floating crust beneath the float. Ah, oh, we bumped one. It's a bit bigger piece of flake. So it sink perhaps a little bit slower. You know, I'm <clears throat> amazed that I haven't had a take then. I think they might want it absolutely on the surface. Try a piece of crust. Now <clears throat> I've also got the quiver tip rod up, which I can use down here and I can free line or use floating crust off a surface. Oh my, oh, that's it. What it was, people, was I had a shot taking it down too fast, and I moved the shot up under the float, and that did the uh, did the trick. Sort of <clears throat> 13 foot match rod, so easily enough for these carp. You can imagine bringing, uh, bringing kids down here, and, or your wife if she wants to get an introduction to fishing, or if you're just a, a senior that wants a bit of peace and quiet and nice surroundings. He's in. What I've done is I put the mat here. Be like the match one do. And you got it absolutely right at your feet. I don't even have to move. So we got a nice common carp. Ideal for the float and let's get it back. The other thing I do is keep the rag on my knee here. 
after last night's all night carp session it's uh, not going to make any difference I'm going to put a bit more tightness in the ground bait ball and hopefully that will make them dig in there a bit more rather than loose feed which they just chomp straight down I can, I can see this bag of dog biscuits is not going to last me very long Just crumble your bread up like this, make a mess, and then throw it all in the water. You might find it easier to cut up your small bits of bread with scissors. In fact, you won't waste as much that way. And then you've got the right size hook baits you want. Mostly, you know, a big, a big hook, I can use a big piece of crust, just break it off. But for smaller pieces of crust like that, I think you'll find it's easier if you use a pair of scissors, it gets neater. I'm expecting one first cast. <clears throat> now then, I can watch the piece of crust and I can also watch the float, which looks like it's sunk. I've moved the shot, needs a float, here he goes. And there's the fish. So that time I saw the, uh... oh he's going for those lilies, oh burn my finger then, and he's got the lilies. I got him out. Yeah, as I was saying, you can use the bread crust as your mark and you obviously strike when that goes. And if you don't see the bread crusts go, you watch the float. It's an absolutely deadly method. Well, I'm low on batteries, guys, so I'm going to bing this off while I get the fish in. Slightly bigger. Possibly, I might use the Avon rod rather than the uh, match rod. You see a lovely looking carp. Very shy of five pounds, probably four and a quarter ish. You can see how it goes quiet now, look. After you hook that fish, it just takes one or two to get the confidence to come back up again. And uh, the whole system starts all over again. Just drifting up that way a little bit. Just rummage through my biscuit box. They're just eating everything. A little piece of crust like that, I've got to take one shot off. Somebody forgot to remind me. Wow, look at all those bubbles coming up there. Now, I'm watching the bread at the moment. If that goes, there's the float that goes. All right, that was just taking that shot off so that I could see the float go and pause a second or so after the uh, fish is actually taking the bait. So don't put any shot near the hook, they've got to be right underneath the float. Now this one's got a bit of a, oh god, my wrists are going to get bigger. It's, it's got a bit of sort of ghost look about it. What do you think? Is it that sort of look of a ghost cart? Does it look like a ghosty to you? Stumpy tail, but the eye's got a bit of blue around it. So 
So I think they've been feeding enough. I'm going to put a piece of bread crust underneath the regular float just on its own and see if I can get a hook up. You can see the action you can get here. Absolutely tailor made for beginners with float fishing. I'm going to try the quiver tip later on. Out we go. I draw the float back just until that straightens the trace out from the float to the piece of floating crust. You want it in a straight line. You can see it's very, very, it's windy today, um, but of course it's long and narrow and sheltered by everything, so it's uh, absolutely ideal for float fishing practice. Now it looks like they want some dog biscuits. Now the ground bait balls I put down here, they are bubbling like crazy on. You rarely only get one cast out of a piece of crust once it's wet, look, it just falls off. There's a nice distance between the bread on the right where the fish just bumped and my float. It's all nice and straight. And that's about two feet from mine. Oh, I just missed him. I actually think it's some rod over there as well. Probably closer to the lilies. There he goes. We're off. Floating crust is about the most deadly uh, technique I feel. All right, I'm going to bing off with the camera until I get him in the net. And you can see the float I'm using with a locking shot either side of the float, they slipped a bit there. A lovely golden colour on that one. Let's get him back. Well, just down here where I put some uh, harder ground bait balls, it's absolutely bubbling like crazy. I'm going to get the other camera, see if I can get some shots for you, and maybe even get the float going away.
Well, you probably notice a lack of surface activity because that's I've stopped feeding on the surface. And by putting the hard balls of ground bait with the sweet corn, that's taken them down. They've gone down for that food. So when they've eaten that, I can come back on the surface and catch really pretty much as many as I want. But what you can do when you get a lot of bubbles like that and you're not getting the return of fish you think you should, say on sweet corn, worms, maggots, whatever, very often they're on the particles of ground bait, especially this Bailey's feed, you know, this good stuff. Um, so you can make a paste like this out of the Bailey's. Just take a pinch like this and just keep working away and moulding it and moulding it and moulding it. And you can wet your hands to get a little bit of water in there, you know, if you want to get it right. You don't want it too stiff. And then just pinch off a piece like that. There's the float, look. As you can see, it goes obviously up for beginners that way. Shots down like this. And it's called locking shot either side. I've got nothing else there. I could do, I could put a shot about here to take it down. But to be honest, the weight of this paste should take it down. Now, you can squeeze it round or flat. I quite like flat. Let's drop it in all those bubbles. See if there's any interest. You'd also only get one bite out of ground bait paste. I think some of those might be bream. By using a floating crust, I can target almost exclusively the carp. But when you've got a bait on the bottom, you can also pick up other fish, maybe tench, bream, something like that. There's definitely other fish down there, not just carp. So you can see with all those bubbles there, there are fish. The bubbles stop, they've eaten everything. So you could get through a huge amount of bait if you wanted to. Of course you get more and more fish digging around in there, but you could also get false bites, float goes under your strike, and it's just a body of a fish knocking the line, you pick up a foul hook fish. I just want to show you, while well, I've still got a bit of battery left, how close they come in, because you know I'm always banging on about margin fishing. Well listen, I'm pretty sure, just out from that rub wrist, I can get fish boiling and swirling. It costs nothing. We're just going to get a ball of ground bait. It's got the corn in it. Look, look where I'm dropping it. I'm going to follow that up with some loose sweet corn. Now, yeah, if you can sort of get a mental note of what that water colour's like because there's two things that's going to happen you're going to see swirls of fish going in there and you're also going to see a change in the colour which is fish mudding what they call mudding in the bottom stirring it all up so fingers crossed we get to see the colour change I can see bits there already let me stand back and of course there's no reason at all why well, you just don't dollop some bread in there as well I mean, it's just a loaf of bread for goodness sake and that will bring fish in as well. And you, you will catch fish down this close, look. I say these fish will eat pretty much the entire loaf of bread today. There's more fish in here than I've got ground bait, that's for certain. See, the thing is, you can be you can be fishing out there deeper and just leave this bread and stuff on this. I can see a fish, there's a swell. You can be fishing out there and just leave this inside here as a sort of second swim. I can be float fishing out in my main baited area and just wonder what's going to come up here. And they will come up here eventually, they'll find that bread. Meanwhile, I'm watching out here. But any movement in there, I will see out the sort of corner of your eye, and you could just bring your tackle in and uh, drop down. Maybe you go free lining, something like that. I'd love to know what's making all those bubbles. I know there's a stack of carp in there, but I'm not getting the takes that I should do in the bubbles. I can catch them off the surface, but I'm not getting the takes there. I want to see what they are. I've got a feeling they're bream. Now there's fish here, because you see the movement of the crust where they're down deeper on that ground bait. I've put, no, 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 look, look. How close is that, people? How close is that? There he is again, look. 
Look, he saw my finger move that time. It's still coming. Look. That's that. I've got fish bubbling all over the place. <laughs> oh my god. There's two there now. Because that sucking noise they make when they're sucking the bread down, I believe, attracts other carp. Look, three. There's three there, four there. Then they'll find the ground bait. And then all I've got to do, you think, oh my god, I'm not getting anything out there. No problem. Tiny piece of crust. He's still down there. I'm just going to leave the camera running. I'm j I don't even need to float in the water. I wind up short. There, I'll just leave my crust there. Now they're stirring up the mud. You might be able to see that where they're digging. They've now found that ground bait ball on the bottom as well. And there we go. Hopefully, guys, a lesson learned of how close you can catch fish in the margins. That was leading the camera running. And the float was in the air and the bait was just hanging there. And you can do that with 15-pound fish as well if you're, if you're quiet. And the water has got, obviously, 15-pound fish in there. Right, I'm going to bring this off and come back to you. Not a big fish. Now another way you can catch fish like this, it's not all about the float, you can use a quiver tip as well. Just a hook and then back here, a BB shot, what's that? Six, eight inches from the hook. And then the bait just resting on the bottom. All I like to do is to hold it with a line across my finger so as I cast out and it sinks down you can very often get a bang or a tug as a fish takes it on the drop as soon as it hits the bottom I can either put the rod down and or hold it and just watch the quiver to pull round Let's see if we can pick one off so the wind's going to put a belly in the line but it doesn't really matter because at the end of the day the fish will still move that so I'm holding it across my fingers like this that's just about going on the bottom and I'm just going to put the rod down there. Well, I'll tell you what to do, put it on the rest, Graham. And what you can do is, if you're looking away, just click it so it can backwind. And then I just tension up. And you're going to wait for the tip to pull. I've thrown all the ground bait in. So I've piled a load of crust in and they're all coming <laughs> along the margin. So I'll try and put the GoPro on a pole and get one right over the top so you can see them taking it and you hear that. So you get used to hearing that sucking noise of they slurping all the uh, bread off the surface. Sometimes it gets caught in rushes and lilies and along the bank edge and you think nothing's going to take them and they know to come in there close. So I'm going to put this piece of flake out, slow sinking with a single BB and they're going to be washing the rod top. So if I'm fishing like this, I'd, instead of pointing at it, I want to angle on the line. So if I'm going to keep dead still, you might be able to see that tip go. So although there is a bit of slack, I can tension up just a little bit there. And the wind will tension the rest, that breeze. And you just have to watch, see if we get a bite on the rod top. That won't even keep caught me by surprise. <laughs> you can see how the quivers will go round. Now I'm going to see if we can get one right under our rod top in a minute on uh, floating crust.
So you can see that's with the with the rods very high, so you can see the bite. Right, let's go for the ultra close in margin fishing rod and see if we can make that uh, quiver tip crash right over. Not in the water. Time for some mega bread. They're going to be there, coming on that lot. So there now is absolutely no line on the surface at all. It's just a piece of crust. It's just a piece of crust there now. There's absolutely no line on the surface at all. And there we go, right in the margins. You just crash a rod top straight over. You get the rod wrist as well. So if you get some tips there, uh, because a rough idea on you know different methods you can use to catch these carp. And obviously there's stacks in here. And no sign of the bream or tench that they got in here. Hopefully there's a few more tips for you, get a few extra fish. Drizzle's coming, I'm going to get wet. I think I caught enough, I could catch a hundred of these if I wanted. But, great place to come if you're a beginner, just want an afternoon's fishing, pop into the tobber and uh, maybe get a ticket and try this. Good practice, and you can try different techniques, you've seen what I've been doing. Why not experiment, that's what it's all about. We'll see you in the next episode, hit the subscribe button, TA Fishing, TA Outdoors, pop over to Mike, see what he's getting up to on the bushcraft and camping scene, and we'll see you in the next fishing program. Great. Well, it's fantastic that Ron can do that painting and that artwork and the other stuff he does at the fantastic age of 97. I think we should all take uh, a hat off to him for that. But when I was 60, the wife commissioned him to do a painting of our garden, just outside with their dog at that time, now passed over to doggy land. Um, and it, it, I just thought you ought to have a look at it. It's a watercolour he did. Well, it was commissioned for my 60th birthday. I'll be 71 this year. So he was doing this when he was 87. Let me just show you. That's the sort of painting that he can do all in watercolour here. And that was the old boy dog who we used to have. But the thing is, over here, we just about see it, is our willow tree, just in here. But the thing is this, it doesn't look like that now. We're just looking at that uh, painting that Ron did, the watercolour, you can see in the corner of the willow tree. Well, we used to have to cut this willow tree here. It was almost down to the ground. Last year it started going peculiar. I mean, it's got to be 80 feet tall. It was beautiful and lush. It's gone right peculiar. And sparse is the word I'm, I'm going. We've got one over here that's uh, pretty much the same, but I want to know what's happening to all our trees. I can show you this one now. You should be able to see up there, there's barely any leaves on it at all. It's unbelievable. I don't think I've ever seen it ever as bad as this. Painfully obvious it's very sickly. Over here on this side, a 
few years ago we had two damson trees here and I actually did make damson jam from them. They both died off. I've since planted, you've probably seen it, from a conker, horse chestnut trees here. They're going, that's three years old, believe it or not, three years old. And you can't say we haven't got much water because the well down there is about average for this time of year. In fact, it's not even low yet. Talking about things that expire, I've got something that's going to expire down the bottom of this garden, I can tell you. I'm fed up with them. Who has the same trouble that I have with moles? And look what they do to my lawn. I'm furious with them. Listen, if I wanted moles to rip up my lawn, I'd be sending them an RSVP invitation by first class post. So I've tried everything, including a bit of Zamo, because you you know, they, it's got a nice pine smell to it. And somebody says, yeah, the smell of pine gets rid of it. I've dribbled some in the hole. <laughs> it doesn't work. But it's windy out there, so I have come into the tackle shack. Otherwise I can't talk to the camera. So, you can see, I have used Zamo, the disinfectant. Well, I got so fed up with these moles, I'm now going to be using Whammo. That's right. I've used everything I can to get rid of moles over the years. Yes, obviously, mole traps. Two caught in ten years with a mole trap, and I think two whacked on the head as they were digging frantically early in the morning, and I gave them a wake-up call with a shovel. Now, I'm going to give him another wake-up call because I've got some of this stuff. One of our builder friends gave us. He said, I've got some of these, Graham. You can have them. It's expanding foam. I thought, do you know that's ideal for squirting down a molehill? However, even though these were free, the downside was it needs an applicator gun thing on the top. Okay, off I popped to the local store, as it were. Yes, sir, exactly that thing. For all oh, five ninety nine, six ninety nine, twenty four pounds, twenty four pounds. I could choke the moles with a bottle of whiskey cheaper than that, couldn't I? So I'm figuring, although I've had to chew at this with a pair of pliers, thinking that might release that cap and squirt it down there. Don't try all these jobs at home that I do, guys. This is just what I do personally on my property. I've had a good old chew at that. I can't make any stuff come out there, so I figure there's something that might. Be a hole in it, whoopsie, a hole in it, and it's one of these things. Mr. Tutu, I figure, this is technical, if I lay that on its side, give it a good shake up, lay it on its side by the molehill, by the hole, and see if I can drill it, will that expanding foam go down the hole? Life is one big experiment here. Come with me and see what happens. I'll try anything once, guys. I'll try anything once. Pierce, we got rid of the mole and the cameras. Actually, it's safe to say 
that the expanding foam does indeed expand very quickly under high impact. So don't try that at home kids. It's just in my own garden. It's an experiment, totally experiment, totally controlled experiment. Well, it's nobody for 500 miles around where we live. I'm amazed how far it spread. More importantly, it's definitely gone, <laughs> it's definitely gone down the molehill or the hole. But of course, I wonder if our friend the mole will just burrow along and pop his head up somewhere else. That's the way it goes. Bit of fun. I bet Mike have wished he'd done it, so I'll just put this out of the way in case the wife gets hold of it. But what else I've been doing is I've stained all the outside, I've repaired all the roof up there because it just got torn off. It just, if I hadn't gone around there, I would never have known. Uh, I've had to reline and reseal around the top of the G stove, the funnel where it goes out. I've stained the outside of the doors, I've stained the outside of the panels, I've stained the chair, I've stained all the pallet wood picket fence. So if you want a cheap picket fence yourself, guys, just get some pallets, go and look on site um, and have a look on uh, TA Fishing, one of our early ones, how to build, how to make picket fencing for pallet woods. I think it's had a, has it had a million views? I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to clear that up. Will that stuff stick to the grass? When I go to rake it up, <laughs> will I rake up the grass as well? All this and much more to be revealed in the next episode of The Lunatic. <laughs> well, it appears we got rid of the mole and the cameras.